Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us on today's webinar, Fracking with Forever Chemicals. I'm Barbara Gottlieb, Director for Environment and Health in the National Office of Physicians for Social Responsibility. We're here today to hear the evidence that so-called forever chemicals, per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, or PFAS, have been used in fracking for oil and gas here in the United States. PFAS are highly toxic chemicals that don't break down in the environment and build up in the human body. Their use in oil and gas wells brings together two planetary emergencies, the poisoning of our planet and the relentless use of fossil fuels, which is driving climate change and contributing to the deadly heat waves that we're seeing, more frequent intense storms, disease spread, and much, much more that endangers our future. Physicians for Social Responsibility places toxic chemicals and climate change among the greatest threats to human health and survival. That's why we're so proud to, to release our new report today, Fracking with Forever Chemicals, which links these two existential issues. The evidence of PFAS use in fracking that you'll be hearing today and that you perhaps read about in the New York Times, I hope you saw the excellent article this morning by Hiroko Tabuchi has been known to chemical manufacturers and oil and gas companies for years, in some cases for decades, but it has been hidden from the public despite the severe dangers of exposure. We'll open our program hearing from the report author, Dusty Horwitt. Mr. Horwitt, an attorney and former reporter, has spent 15 years researching, writing, and working to protect communities from the health and environmental impacts of oil and gas drilling and fracking. His research and his voice have been instrumental in securing protection from drilling and fracking for New York State, the George Washington National Forest, and the Delaware River Basin. It's been my pleasure to, to collaborate with him on earlier reports relating to chemicals used in fracking, then to bring him to PSR as a consultant and to work with him on this new report. This new report began with a Freedom of Information Act request of FOIA that he filed with the US EPA back in 2014. And it resulted in EPA re releasing thousands of pages of documents. The information that Mr. Horwick gleaned from those pages are the basis for today's report. We're honored, I mean, we are really honored to be joined by three outstanding issue experts who will comment on the report's implications after Mr. Horwick speaks. I'd like to introduce them now in the order in which they will speak. Uh, Linda Birnbaum, PhD, DABT, ATS, is probably best known as the director of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, NIEHS, in the National Institutes of Health and the National Toxicology Program from 2009 to 2019. A board certified toxicologist, Dr. Birnbaum served as a leading federal scientist for 40 years, including at the US EPA, where she directed the agency's largest division focusing on environmental health research. Dr. Birnbaum has received more awards than I have time to tell you about, but among them in 2010, she was elected to the Institute of Medicine of the National Academies. It's one of the highest honors in the fields of medicine and health. Dr. Birnbaum is the author of more than 700 peer reviewed publications, book chapters and reports. Silverio Caggiano is the recently retired battalion chief of the Youngstown, Ohio Fire Department, where he served for 39 years, 11 of them as chief. Chief Caggiano performed as a medic and also as team command officer and specialist on hazardous materials and weapons of mass destruction. He was also an original member of the State of Ohio Hazmat WMD Technical Advisory Committee, serving there for 17 years. Chief Caggiano has cultivated a professional knowledge of PFAS, given that firefighters, water-resistant uniforms, the firefighting foam that they use, and also fires and spills at fracking sites can put first responders in danger of PFAS exposure. He has engaged in right-to-know activities related to the fracking industry and has testified before legislatures, engaged in community education, and has been interviewed for documentaries on oil and gas. Our third respondent is Wilma Subra, a chemist who combines research and evaluation to provide technical assistance to communities concerned with their environment and their health. As president of the Subra company, Ms. Subra is currently focused on the environmental and health, human health impacts of shale development, including developing parameters for groundwater and surface water monitoring. She has served in multiple leadership roles, 
including as vice president of the EPA's National Advisory Council for Environmental Policy and Technology, a member of the EPA National Environmental Justice Advisory Council, and chair of the EPA's technical workshop for the hydraulic fracturing study on chemical and analytical methods. Ms. Subra received the MacArthur Fellowship Genius Award in 1999 for helping ordinary citizens understand, cope with, and combat environmental issues in their communities. After all the speakers have completed, I'll open up the floor for questions and answers. Uh, please write your uh, questions into the question section on the screen. You'll see the little Q&A sign at the bottom of the screen. And you can do that throughout the program. We'll hold the questions until the end. If we have any members of the press here, please preface your question with your name and the name of your media outlet. And if we can spot you, uh, I will definitely give questions to, uh, to your, pri give priority, excuse me, to your questions. Now to hear from our presenters. Uh, this presentation, by the way, is being recorded. We listeners will be muted during the presentations. And I am pleased to turn the mic over to Dusty Horwood. Dusty? All right, thanks so much, Barb, for that introduction. And thanks to everyone for joining us today. I'm just gonna share my screen. Go. Uh, so I'm going to give an overview of the major findings of the report and some background behind it, and then we'll hear from our other presenters. So as as Barb mentioned, uh, the report that Physicians for Social Responsibility is releasing today, and that was featured in the New York Times, uh, presents evidence suggesting that PFAS or chemicals that could break down into PFAS have been used for hydraulic fracturing in more than 1,200 oil and gas wells in six states, Arkansas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, New Mexico, Texas, and Wyoming. Uh, PFAS may have been used more widely in oil and gas extraction than the evidence that we found, um, both geographically in additional states and also in different stages of oil and gas extraction, such as drilling that precedes fracking, or in different oil and gas extraction techniques. But it's difficult to know for sure uh, because of the lack of full chemical disclosure in the oil and gas industry. Uh, as Barb mentioned, the reason that Physicians for Social Responsibility is so concerned about the use of these chemicals in oil and gas extraction is because they're toxic in minuscule quantities, they persist in the environment, and they bioaccumulate inside us and inside animals. Um, the investigation began, as Barb mentioned, with a FOIA request in 2014. And the FOIA request sought records on new chemicals that EPA had uh, reviewed under its new chemicals program under the Toxic Substances Control Act. These chemicals have been proposed by chemical manufacturers for use in oil and gas drilling or fracking. And what we wanted to see was how EPA assessed uh, these chemicals for health concerns and how EPA uh, reviewed, uh, regulated these chemicals. Now, what, what we found in, uh, in these documents, um, among other things, uh, was that EPA reviewed uh, three chemicals that regulators thought could break down into a substance similar to PFOA. PFOA is the most infamous of the PFAS substances and was the subject of a feature Hollywood movie released last year or in 2019 called Dark Waters. Uh, starring Mark Ruffalo. Uh, EPA regulators also had health concerns about these chemicals, um, but allowed them to be used uh, commercially. And one of those chemicals did go into commercial use. The, there was a lot of uh, confidentiality claims in these documents. Under federal law, manufacturers and importers of new chemicals are allowed to claim as confidential almost any uh, piece of information related to their chemicals. And this manufacturer or importer did. One piece of information, however, that was available in the records was the generic name of these three chemicals. And you can see it on the screen here. 
fluorinated acrylic alkyl amino copolymer. We took that name and we searched for it in a database called Frac Focus that um, is a database showing uh, the fracking chemicals that oil and gas companies have used in thousands of wells in more than 20 states across the US. While we did not find um, that particular chemical is being used in fracking, uh, we did find several other uh, chemicals with related names, and you can see those on the screen. Uh, fluorinated benzoic salts, fluoroalcohol, uh, alcohol substituted polyethylene glycol, fluorosurfactants, and three other chemicals. Now in fracking, um, as people may know, uh, companies inject typically a mix of water, sand, and chemicals at high pressure to fracture underground formations. And so these chemicals were among those listed in that mix. Um, we're, we're not exactly sure what the chemicals are used for, but the records provides, provided some clues. Um, they could be used, uh, for example, for friction, friction reducing in the fracking uh, mix. Um, some could be used as tracers that allow companies to uh, determine the extent of underground formations. But what was really alarming about um, these chemical names is what happened when we went to an EPA database of um, fracking of, of PFAS chemicals, and two of these chemicals showed up on the EPA database as PFAS. And then we shared these chemical names with uh, a number of chemical and health experts, including um, uh, Wilma and Linda, who are on the webinar today. And the health experts said that these chemicals are either PFAS or they are potentially PFAS or chemicals that could break down into PFAS as the EPA regulators were concerned could happen with the fluorinated acrylic alkyl amino copolymer. We found that more than 130 oil and gas companies reported using these chemicals um, in, as I mentioned, uh, more than 1,200 oil and gas wells across the United States in hydraulic fracturing. Um, and I want to emphasize that this, despite the fact that we know that PFAS have been used throughout our economy uh, for decades, this is the first time that their use in oil and gas extraction has been publicized. It's, it was not widely known um, that this was occurring, um, even though we did find some um, scientific articles showing that PFAS likely have been used in the oil and gas industry for decades. Among the companies reported uh, who have reported using uh, PFAS or uh, potential PFAS or chemicals that could break down into PFAS are ExxonMobil and its subsidiary XTO Energy, Chevron Corporation, Anadarko, which was a co-owner along with BP of the Macondo well in the Gulf of Mexico that spewed millions of gallons of oil into the Gulf, um, EOG Resources, a major producer of oil from shale formations in the United States, and in Canna Corporation, which used to be one of uh, Canada's top oil and gas producers until it moved to the United States uh, a couple of years ago. What is most concerning to physicians for social responsibility and others about the use or potential use of PFAS in oil and gas extraction are the risks to our health. Um, it's not just that people uh, living near oil and gas operations could be exposed to PFAS themselves, but it's also that they could be exposed to PFAS in conjunction with many other highly toxic chemicals that have been found to be associated with oil and gas extraction, including carcinogenic benzene and carcinogenic radium, um, which is often found in shale formations and comes up to the surface with wastewater. There's both anecdotal evidence and scientific evidence that has emerged in past years showing uh, that people living near oil and gas uh, operations uh, suffer significant health effects. Uh, one example of the anecdotal evidence was the uh, report published last year by the Pennsylvania Attorney General that was the result of a criminal grand jury investigation of uh, unconventional gas drilling impacts in Pennsylvania. Uh, some 70 families talked about their experiences 
uh, with the Attorney General's office, including uh, serious health impacts they suffered. And then there have been scientific studies that have linked living near oil and gas operations to uh, cancer, low birth weight babies, um, respiratory conditions. Um, some of the PFAS, the specific health concerns associated with PFAS um, includes uh, some that overlap with these um, health concerns I mentioned, cancer, low infant birth weights, um, thyroid issues, um, preeclampsia, which is a, a serious condition affecting pregnant women. And a recent concern is that PFAS may um, reduce antibody responses to vaccines and infectious disease resistance, which is, of course, a concern during the pandemic. Further concerns about health and uh, PFAS and other chemicals used um, include the fact that uh, wells are often located in or adjacent to uh, disadvantaged communities uh, where lower income people live, uh, people of color, indigenous people. And there are um, often uh, vulnerable populations near oil and gas wells, including pregnant women, children, uh, first responders, and Syl can speak to that, um, who might unknowingly encounter uh, PFAS chemicals when they respond to accidents at well sites, and oil and gas field workers who may uh, have regular exposure uh, to these chemicals on well sites. There are multiple pathways for exposure at oil and gas operations, um, some of which have been detailed by EPA in the 2016 report on fracking and drinking water. Uh, they include the wastewater, which comes up from underground um, after drilling and fracking are complete. The wastewater can include both toxic chemicals in the formation and also some of the chemicals that were injected underground in the fracking operations. Um, that wastewater is often injected into underground disposal wells for supposedly permanent disposal, but those wells have been known to leak into groundwater. Sometimes the wastewater is spread on roads where it can run off into water supplies or become airborne when people drive on the roads. Uh, you can have other air pathways, including um, volatilization of the chemicals from huge uh, ground level pools of wastewater uh, and through flaring of natural gas at wells. And finally, there can be uh, chemical leaks and spills uh, of the chemicals um, at the well sites from the, from the tanks in which they're stored. Once PFAS gets into the environment, um, it's problematic to clean it up and expensive. Uh, it can disperse widely in water. Uh, as we have said, it doesn't break down. Uh, it's expensive. We talked to a gentleman named uh, Bob Delaney, who's quoted in our report, who was head of a, a PFAS cleanup task force in Michigan, where I'm located. And he talked about how uh, it can cost millions of dollars to clean up PFAS from water. You have to use um, activated carbon filters, uh, which are similar to what you find in a Brita filter, except the quantities have to be much, much greater. And then once that carbon fills up with PFAS and perhaps other contaminants, you have to dispose of it somewhere. And he said that landfills can be reluctant to accept this waste because of liability concerns should their landfill become contaminated with the PFAS. And speaking of the state of Michigan, um, Michigan just last year enacted some of the newest standards for PFAS in drinking water. Um, the standard for PFOA in drinking water was just eight parts per trillion. That means anything above that is considered unsafe. And to put that in perspective, at that level of toxicity, one measuring cup of PFOA could contaminate about 8 billion gallons of drinking water, which is about the amount of drinking water that New York City uses in a week. It's, a, it's an extremely uh, toxic class of chemicals. Uh, finally, I just want to bring it uh, bring this back to the beginning um, and emphasize that this investigation all began when we found evidence that EPA had approved for commercial use new chemicals uh, for oil and gas uh, extraction that they thought could break down into a PFOA-like substance. Despite, uh, despite that concern, despite additional health concerns, uh, liver toxicity, blood toxicity, male reproductive toxicity, tumor formation, EPA approved these chemicals 
And we found evidence that they uh, were still being used commercially for unspecified purposes because of confidentiality claims, at least as recently as 2018. Um, you can see here on this slide, some of the confidentiality claims we encountered in these documents that make it very difficult for the public to know what's going on and where these chemicals are being used. Uh, this is an excerpt that shows that the company that submitted this, uh, these chemicals to EPA for commercial use um, withheld its own name as confidential. You can see all the X's in the document. And then this document shows that the company uh, at the bottom, the very lower part of the document, um, withheld the chemicals CAS registry number. That, that stands for Chemical Abstracts Service Registry Number, which is the best way to identify chemicals. Each chemical has only one chemical abstract service number, um, even though it can have multiple names or trade names. So that was withheld as confidential. Um, and, and it makes it difficult for the public then to search for this chemical in a database like uh, Frac Focus to find out where it's being used. Um, EPA, EPA's regulation of these chemicals, including the one that did in fact go into commercial use, uh, was very lax. Um, EPA did not track where the chemicals were being used, um, did, has not performed testing to see if the chemicals were breaking down as they feared, and did not require any limits on use of these chemicals within proximity to homes or schools or water supplies and then also had some dubious assumptions about um, how the chemicals might be released, which I could uh, perhaps get into in the Q&A session. Um, finally, we have a number of recommendations in the report. I won't go through them all, but um, among them are a uh, health assessment con uh, combined with uh, tracking and testing for these chemicals in the environment so we can understand where they've been used, um, not just the ones that EPA regulated, but um, the ones that we identified in frac focus and any PFAS chemicals or PFAS precursors that might have been used in oil and gas drilling. Uh, and, and we also are, are asking for a moratorium on PFAS use for oil and gas extraction until this testing can be completed. Our recommendations are both directed to the EPA and to state governments, which um, are the primary regulators of oil and gas in the United States. Um, and, and finally, um, we have a letter um, to EPA asking EPA to take some of these actions. Um, the link is here on my presentation. It's on PSR's website. And so we encourage people uh, to sign the letter and encourage EPA to act to protect the public from these uh, very dangerous chemicals. So, thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you, Dusty Horwitz. Uh, that was a wonderful overview, um, quite a lot of information. Once again, we encourage everybody to go to the PSR website, psr.org, uh, and you'll see the same image that you're looking at now. Um, click there and you'll be taken through to the report, uh, to the letter, and to some additional information. Our next speaker will be Dr. Linda Birnbaum. Dr. Birnbaum? Well, thank you very much um, to the PSR folks for inviting me to have this opportunity to very briefly go over some of the issues that I see with PFAS. Um, Dusty has done a fabulous job of setting the stage, of you know, mentioning that living near frac sites is not good for your health. There is growing evidence or increase in epidemiological investigations showing that effects, for example, heart attacks, preterm birth, low birth weight, asthma, those are just a couple of the examples. And I will mention that all of those things are associated with PFAS as well. Now, I think one of the problems, again, that um, Dusty has put up is the point of transparency. There is essentially limited to no um, disclosure of what is used in, at frac sites. Certain states do have requirements, but most do not. And therefore, it's very difficult to find out what is being used in, in fracking wells. Um, another thing that I think we need to think about here is that PFAS, unlike some of the other compounds that we, that we do know, such as some of the volatile organic carbons, things like benzene, which are known carcinogens in frac fluid, PFAS are really useful chemicals. They are very helpful for solubilization and um, preventing sticking and all that kind of thing. 
Um, however, again, as Dusty has mentioned, these chemicals are forever. The carbon fluorine bond is extremely difficult to make. It basically or barely exists in nature and there are no easy ways to break it down. So once you form a PFAS, it's going to, it or its breakdown, which will still have PFAS molecules in it, it will have the carbon fluorine bonds, they are going to be with us essentially forever. Now, Dusty alluded to many of the different kinds of health impacts that have been shown to be caused not only by PFOA, but by several other PFAS have been studied. Now, I will not say that every PFAS does exactly the same thing, but many of them do similar things. So for example, effects have clearly been shown for PFOA on preterm birth, impacts on the immune system, impacts on uh, thyroid, so they're clearly endocrine disrupting chemicals, impacts, for example, on the liver and at the kidney, they are liver and, I mean, excuse me, kidney and testicular carcinogens, growing information that not only PFOA, but PFOS and some of the substitutes, things like Gen X, which some of you may have heard about, are, do many of the same things, including, for example, not only impacts on the male reproductive system, but impacts on the female reproductive system at all. So for example, exposure to PFAS in utero is associated with problems with mammary gland development. Many of the things that I'm mentioning are not just found in people. They're also found, for example, in animals. And when I talk animals here, I'm not just talking fish or rats or mice. I'm also talking about non-human primates. So I think it's very, very important to understand that this class of chemicals is huge. There's not one, two, or 10 or 20 PFAS. EPA now says there are over 9,252 PFAS. Not all are intentionally produced. Some are products that evolve from the production of polymers. And PFAS, most of the use, things like Teflon are made from PFOA, now from Gen X, but the polymers in that production, there's always some leakage from the production site. And then many of the polymers have side chains, which actually can break off and generate some of these molecules for which we have great concern. And another thing is, is what, what has happened is that when industry finds out or the data starts building that things like PFOA and PFOS are bad, they, they say they're no longer making them and they may not be intentionally, but then they just substitute. So instead of PFOA and PFOS, you may have PFHXS, which has fewer carbons than PFOS. You may, may have PFBS, you may have PFDA. Again, the numbers of carbon chains or the structures may change, but many of these structures can break down to give you some of our old favorites as well. So here we have thousands and thousands of chemicals. I know that PSR has been able to identify the use of several in fracking. I don't think, we don't know that there aren't more that are being used. We don't know how they break down and we know that they will never go away. So thanks for listening. Well, thank you, Dr. Birnbaum. Our next speaker will be Battalion Chief Silverio Caggiano. So, I right, thank you uh, for this opportunity to uh, be a part of this distinguished group. Uh, and as usual, Dusty did one of his excellent jobs in putting together a national report. Kudos. Um, as a firefighter uh, for the past 39 years, I've literally been up to my eyes in this product. Uh, it's in our turnout gear. At least the first two layers of our turnout gear uh, contain. Uh, PFOS chemicals. Some have even uh, went as far as putting it in all three layers. It's been in the uh, Ansel foams that we've used uh, over the years. And like Linda said, some of the new stuff coming out Sil, you seem to have frozen. Well, uh, hang in there, give Sil another moment. Be back. Uh, the uh, 
the, the foams in that that we've used over the years have, have all contained it. And, and like Linda said, the, the analogs are now coming out. And a lot of these companies are, are you know, buying that stuff up. Uh, there are other alternatives out there like encapsulating foams similar to the F500s um, that most people have went to because the CDC, the EPA, uh, a lot of these agencies have come out and said, this is cancer causing. You've got to phase it out of your uh, out of your inventories. Uh, my department totally phased it out of our inventories as soon as we realized it, but we still have turnout gear that has it in it. Um, the other problem that you're running into is not all the fire departments are getting the memo. Uh, let's say we have a fire at a wellhead site where you have a let's say volunteer company that can't afford to turn over all their product and they utilize uh, a, a regular uh, AFFF or ARFFF or whatever they're going to use, whatever is burning at this wellhead site. And now the EPA comes in and they start doing their testing because, you know, we're not getting all of our, our uh, tier two reporting at all from these people. And, and we're kind of guessing what chemicals are there. And most of the information that we're getting is all, you know, after the fact. Uh, they start doing their testing to make sure that they're reporting them. Here's PFOS. Well, the, the wellhead people may have been using it all through the fracking, but the first thing they're going to do is, well, that came from the fire department's firefighting foam. That's not our thing. So they're going to shift the blame. And in shifting the blame, they shift the lawsuit to another person. It's another real possibility out there. Um, this industry has continued to surprise me almost on a daily basis. The more you turn, you turn the rocks over, or as I call it, the further down the rabbit hole you get, the more you know, characters that you meet. Uh, and, you know, it, it's, it, it's astounding. And, and as firefighters are, you know, even our internationals drug into this because on one hand, we have a proactive cancer firefighting um, program, but on the other hand, we're accepting money from, you know, we're accepting donations from the, the makers of uh, turnout gear that has PFOS in it. Um, the NFPA is tiptoeing around trying to create legislation that doesn't make an undue burden on departments uh, trying to get rid of the PFOS containing foam. So it, it's not just in fracking, the fracking industry, it's in the fire industry and we're getting it in the industry, we're getting hit from all ends. Because like I said, not only are we dealing with it, I waded through, uh, you know, when we had old foam, we used it for training. I waded through that stuff up to my eyeballs. My turnout gear has it on it. Uh, my guys are now encountering it if they go to a fracking site. Um, you know, where, where does this end? Where are we going to start taking care of the environment and the people that, you know, like the first responders and that, that got to deal with this stuff? Okay, thank you, Battalion Chief Caggiano. Our next speaker will be Chemist Wilma Subra. Thank you. And thank you, Dusty, for the magnificent report with all the critical data that community members need to deal with the situation. Hydraulic fracturing and shale formations requires fracking fluids that contain surfactants to reduce interfacial tension in the shale formation, requires friction reducing chemicals, biocides, scale and corrosion inhibitors, iron control breakers, and propping agents to prop open the formation once it is fracked. PFAS is a surface tension reducer. Thus, were it not for its toxicity and forever life, its characteristics would fit into hydraulic fracturing fluid. But unfortunately, it has been used in hydraulic fracturing fluid and will be around in the environment forever. Three to eight million gallons of fracking fluids are required for each fracking operation. And Dusty told you about how far one cup of this PFOS goes. 20 to 30% of the fracking fluids remain subsurface underground, but 70 to 80% of the frac fluids return to the surface as flowback fluids. The flowback fluids bring back to the surface contaminants from the fracking formation itself, radioactive components, produce water which contains volatile and semi-volatile organic compounds and toxic heavy metals. If PFAS or associated chemicals were used in the fracking fluid, they will return to the surface and in the flowback fluid and potentially contaminate the environment and negatively impact human health. According to the data tables, 
that Dusty has in his report that you have not yet seen. Six of the 10 wells are located in the Permian Shale Basin in Texas, and two of the wells are in the Permian Shale Basin in New Mexico, and the other two wells are located in Oklahoma, and they were drilled in the Woodford Shale. The Permian Basin is the largest petroleum producing basin in the United States and produces both oil and natural gas. The Woodford Shale produces natural gas and light oil. In the Permian Basin, there's a lack of adequate pipeline capacity. So a large portion of the produced natural gas is dented to the atmosphere or flared. And based on personal knowledge, the pilot lights and the flares are frequently not lit. So when the company thinks they're gonna put natural gas diverted to the flare, it just actually vents into the atmosphere and has the potential to contaminate the environment. The available pipelines themselves are used to transport the crude oil to refineries and processing facilities. When frac fluid could contain PFAS substances or substances that could degrade or react and form PFAS substances, the flowback fluids from the fracking and production activities have the potential to contaminate the environment and cause negative human health impacts. The flowback fluid is actually placed in surface impoundments, lined impoundments, and the liner leaks. Placed in tanks, trucks, pipelines, hoses, and injection wells. Leaks, spills, and overflows have resulted in flowback fluid flowing and contaminating the environment, the air, soil, sediment, surface water, groundwater, wastewater, terrestrial and aquatic flora and fauna, agricultural lands and crops, forest lands, and wetlands. The forever chemical contaminants are then available to contaminate humans directly or indirectly and cause severe and extensive negative health impacts. And you heard those from both Dusty and Linda, some of which are contained in the report. Because of it being a forever chemical, the contaminated media is forever available to be sources of exposure to all contaminated areas, even when land use changes. How often have you seen subdivisions, parks, schools, churches constructed over areas or adjacent to areas where you historically knew oil and gas drilling and production operations had taken place, where pipe yards had operated or where drill pits had been located? These areas are potential contaminated forever. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Subra. Time now for question and answer. As I said, we were going to um, prioritize the questions from members of the news media. We have a few of those. Let me open them up and I will um, I'll actually read them. And uh, if we can coordinate this uh, with Julia, we'll also unmute the, uh, the questioners from the media in case you have follow-up questions. So our first question is from Susan Phillips with WHYY Radio in Philadelphia. And she asks, can you tell me if you did not find evidence of these substances in Pennsylvania, or do you think they could have been used but avoided disclosure due to trade secret claims? Dusty, you want to start us off on that and see if anybody else wants to add? Sure. Uh, thanks for the question, Susan. Um, it is true we did not find evidence of the use of these chemicals in Pennsylvania. However, uh, there, uh, that doesn't mean that the chemicals have not been used in Pennsylvania. Um, yeah, as, as I mentioned, there is not full disclosure of, of chemicals used in oil and gas operations. I, I don't think there is full disclosure in any state. Um, Pennsylvania, under Pennsylvania law, uh, the companies that are engaged in unconventional gas drilling have to disclose their fracking chemicals to frac focus. However, uh, they can withhold as uh, trade secrets uh, basically any chemical they want. Uh, plus, they don't have to disclose the chemicals they use in drilling that precedes fracking um, at all. And we know, we know that they often withhold the identities of chemicals um, that are used in fracking. Uh, they, they don't have to disclose the chemicals used in drilling. And there is no requirement that the chemical manufacturers themselves who know the most 
about what's going into the fracking wells uh, make the chemical disclosures. The disclosures in Pennsylvania are made by companies further down the supply chain. Um, so we can't be confident that we know everything that's being used in Pennsylvania. The last thing I'll say is um, Exxon uh, in the form of XTO Energy and Chevron are among the companies that have operated in Pennsylvania um, that also use these chemicals in, in other states that are named in our report. Um, so you might start by asking them if they have used these chemicals in Pennsylvania. And certainly Pennsylvania authorities should investigate whether these chemicals have been used in the state. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Dusty. Um, we'll go on to the next question. This is from Cheryl Hogue, a reporter from Chemical and Engineering News. She says the chemical P11091, which is one of the ones we looked at in the PSR report, is also used commercially, as she shows in a document, but we won't go to the link right now. The question is, do you have concerns about other possible uses of this substance in addition to fracking? And I would open up this question to Dusty or any of the commentators. Um, I'll, I'll just say briefly, uh, the short answer is yes. Um, in the EPA documents, um, the specific use or uses of the chemical were withheld as confidential business information. The only uh, available information in the, in the documents was a generic use called uh, oil and water repellent, I believe. And so we don't, we don't know exactly where else it was used, but based on EPA's concerns and the general concerns about PFAS, uh, we would be concerned about other uses. I'd like to just quickly add on that. I think it's important to realize that these PFAS are used everywhere and in almost everything. They are heavily used in lots of consumer products. I don't know whether this one, one specific one, for example, is used in makeup. As a report coming out about two weeks ago made it clear that at least 50% of makeup, after looking at many, many, many samples, contained PFAS. So the point is, is that we as human beings are not, don't have only one source of exposure, you know, from fracking might be one, but, and we've heard from Silverio about the use in, in firefighting foam where it has been used extensively. And in fact, its use was required in certain places, but we're also finding that it, it's just in everywhere. So things that, for example, are water repellent are used on your outside umbrella or your hiking boots or your clothes or your carpets. Thank you. We'll go to our next media inquiry. This is from Julia John with Chemical Watch. The question is, how likely are the EPA and other agencies to follow the recommendations made in the report, including a moratorium on PFAS use for oil and gas extraction? And how exactly should the EPA implement the moratorium? Dusty, you wanna start us off on that? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I can't speak for, uh, exactly for EPA on this, but uh, we would hope that uh, EPA would follow through on, on the recommendations. I think uh, considering the uh, EPA's poor record of regulation of uh, toxic chemicals generally and in the oil and gas chemical space, um, it's going to take some effort by citizens uh, to, uh, to encourage EPA to take these steps. Um, EPA does have expanded authority under the new Toxic Substances Control Act enacted in, um, in 2016. And, and we would hope that the EPA would be able to use that expanded authority um, to take some of the steps that we're asking for. Okay, I'll move along to the next question. Uh, the next question is from Ron Saff. He asks, I want to check for PFAS locally in water supplies. Cost is prohibitive, hundreds of dollars for one sample. Is there any lab in the country that does it inexpensively? And I, I wonder, um, Wilma Subra, if this might not be a good question for you, given your knowledge of uh, uh, water monitoring. 
So the only way you are going to know whether PFAS is in your drinking water supply is for you to have a sample tested. It is not a required chemical to be tested by the health departments in most of the states, the drinking water systems are regulated by the health department. And PFAS is not a required component. So one of the things we could also put in Dusty's recommendation is that that chemical classification be required to be monitored in drinking water sources. I think it's important to realize, well, that was absolutely true. Um, there's a lot of effort being made to measure the total amount of organic fluoride, which is present, for example, in drinking water or food or any of the other many sources. Um, this would give you an indication of how much PFAS may be there. There are other kinds of organic fluoride, like certain kinds of medicines, um, may contain it, but the vast majority would likely be PFAS. And in a couple of places where that has been looked at, for example, in, in um, the Cape Fear River in North Carolina, the known PFAS only represented less than 30% of the total amount of organic fluoride in the water. So I think it's important to realize, but there's a lot of work being um, going forward to try to develop better analytical approaches that again could at least say or help you understand is there or is there not a problem. Uh, next question from David Drake, uh, until recently a resident of Southwestern Colorado. He asks, once a well has been fracked, what are the health concerns <clears throat> with an ongoing well that is producing gas? So I'll answer part of that. Once it's fracked, as I told you, the percentages that frac fluid stays subsurface and the percentage that comes to the surface. However, any contaminant that you also put down there will continue to contaminate the products that are coming out of the well. So just because you can say I fracked it two weeks ago and now everything's okay is not the case. The contaminants are there subsurface as well as surface and continuing to come to the surface as the products, oil and gas are produced. Well, anybody else who wants to comment on perhaps some of the other um, broader uh, paths to exposure for these PFAS chemicals? It it's, uh, doesn't just end at the well. Yeah, the. Uh... The stuff that comes up from the wells, uh, usually if it's you know if it's a horizontal well, usually end up in brine haulers. And here's where the real danger comes in. Uh, these brine haulers are not. There, there's nothing about this industry that's regulated like any other industry in the entire United States, and that includes the brine haulers that pull the stuff up and ship it to its terminal distribution or storage places in injection wells below ground, which basically are uh, the next Superfund sites of the future without barrels. So these guys are uh, loading the stuff up. Um, they're not protected. They have improper uh, PPE to handle the stuff. They're loading this stuff up into trucks and they're trucking it through your neighborhoods, across your freeways, past your schools, past your homes, you know, past everything. And they, you know, if, if I had to do this or you had to do this and we were a private entity, We'd have to have guys that were trained in Hazwopper uh, for the truck. You'd have to be properly placarded. You'd have to be insured, you know, out your backside. But these people aren't properly trained. Their trucks are only marked residual waste. And they're hauling this stuff to these injection wells. And if they roll over, which they have often done, and they spill this contaminant, and think, think about where most of your frac uh, sites are, rural America, and we've had most of our rollovers in rural America and they've dumped this into the fields. Now there's remediation that does go on. Do we get it all up? Don't we get it all up? I don't know. But this ends up going up your food chain. It gets into your water, it gets into your food. Your animals eat it. You kill the animal, you eat the animal, you're ingesting it. It's the same thing with the radium that's coming out of there, which is another byproduct and problem of the fracking industry. So it, it's getting everywhere. And the sloppy handling of this product mm. due to unregulation is, uh, is, is a huge problem. 
So, you know, it, it could be anywhere. You could be driving down the street or you could see a truck roll by your house. And that stuff is in there, along with the radium and all the other bad stuff that's in there. Thank you. Our next question is from uh, Tracy Carluccio with the Delaware Riverkeeper Network. Um, she asks, uh, what is the most accurate means of testing various environmental media, water, air, soil, et cetera, for these PFAS compounds that may have been used in fracking? I think we have a couple of people who might answer that. There is no one approved method. Um, EPA has some approved methods for a limited number of specific PFAS. Um, as I said, there's a lot of effort being, um, being used to develop ways to get um, some measure of the total organic fluoride, um, which could be used, but there's no one method. And you often would have to use a different method in water versus, um, for example, uh, soil versus food. Okay, um, this question is from Gregory Harmon. Uh, because of how widely and quickly PFAS chemical plumes spread in aquifers, is it possible to do in situ treatment given the incredible, that within the well, given the incredible depths that some of these fracking wells are injecting these chemicals? Okay. Um, there really is no easy way to get rid of these PFAS once they're formed. If you have, for example, I can't speak to the well specifically, but if you have contaminated your drinking water, for example, or your river or what, say your drinking water, um, granular activated charcoal filtration will not remove many of the newer PFAS that are being used, it may remove some of the old ones, but of course then what do you do with the, the contaminated material? Do you put that in a landfill from which it may leak? Um, there is a process called reverse osmosis, which is uh, quite effective with many PFAS, um, but it's, quite, it's also expensive. And then again, what do you do with the material that you've removed? Thank you. Uh, next question uh, from Patricia Libby. Are we still to toss our Teflon covered cookware due to PFAS in it? I'll take that too. Um, I will tell you that I got rid of my Teflon pans, um, even my baking pans uh, a number of years ago because of the fact that when you heat the polymer to high temperatures, it can release PFAS, which um, are toxic. Um, there are some nonstick cookware that you can purchase today. Just be careful that you don't buy something that is labeled PFOA free. That is a clue that there are other PFAS that are used instead. <laughs> I think uh, PFAS is a, you can't, can't win for losing uh, situation. <clears throat> a question from Kathleen Nolan, with the Catskill Mountain Keeper. Um, is it likely that the fluorine in these chemicals is the source of the toxicity? <clears throat> and are these chemicals related to the fluorinated compounds, <clears throat> excuse me, that are a major source of global warming? That's a great question. And the point is, is it's not, the, the, the toxicity is not specifically related to the fluorine atom. It's related to the structure of the entire molecule. And Different groups have different definitions of what makes a PFAS, but, I, but at least some of the groups that I work with and in some of the papers that we've published about the need to consider treating PFAS in total as a class do look at things like the um, hydrofluorocarbons, which for example, can be used in re registration as a type of PFAS. We have a question from Janice Petzl to uh, Chief Caggiano. Are there foams, are there firefighting foams that are safe or safer to use? And if so, is it possible to get a list of uh, the foams that contain PFAS and should be phased out? Um, mostly anything produced prior to 19, or 2018 
has PFOS in it. Most of your ARA triple Fs, most of your uh, A triple Fs have the PFOS in it. The newer stuff out there is coming out and it's saying non, you know, non PFOA containing or PFOS containing uh, chemicals. But then again, in order for this to work right, you still have to have some analog of that particular chemical in it. Um, like I said, our, our, you can get, we call them the cream foams, but then you're gonna start putting a lot of more water onto the, the uh, to make the, uh, the foam. Um, our department went to encapsulating uh, agents, which basically do that without the need for the PFOA or PFOS chemicals in them. Uh, something like an F500 or something like that. But if you go back down and you start looking at your anything before 2000 or 2018, uh, chem, you know, the, the chem foams, the 3M foams, um, the uh, Ansel foams, you, if they don't say they don't, if they don't say they do not contain the PFOS, they got it. And that's basically what we did with our inventory in Youngstown. Uh, we just totally got rid of it and we, we bought into the F500 encapsulating foam system. Um, you don't have to do that. You can find other things, but then again, there's always the trade-off. Because you got to remember what made that foam so great was the, the uh, PFOS chemical that was in it. And a lot of these companies, as brought out by Linda, though they don't say they don't have a PFOS in it, they do have some analog thereof, and this stuff could potentially break down. And the problem you get it into is the NFPA hasn't really come out and said anything strong about this. Um, the EPA in the discussions I have said, well, you know, you can keep the foam and still use it. You just got to use it in the place that's contained. Well, the fine contained. And, and I, how are you going to contain it unless you're, you're dealing in a, you know, in a cement bermed area? So they won't come out and say to get rid of it, but they're telling you, you should get rid of it. And if you look at the CDC and you look at the, you know, the fire department, uh, the fire international association of fire cancer thing, they're telling you, don't, don't use it, get rid of it, replace it. It's cancerous, it does this and that. But at the same time, they too walk this edge because they're tied into a lot of your, uh, your turnout gear and your turnout gear got it. Every single one, if you, if you have Lions product, not only is it on the outer shell and the, and the vapor barrier, but it's on the inner shell too. So, you know, it, it's, if you're a firefighter, it's, it's on you, you're in it, you've been exposed. Um, just document, document, document. But to answer your question as far as the foam, anything before 19, or 2018 and anything that doesn't specifically say it is not, it doesn't contain it, get rid of it. Thank you. We have a question from Ranjana Bandari with uh, Livable Arlington in Arlington, Texas. She says, uh, is there a way to find out exactly where these chemicals were used in Texas? Uh, Dusty, I wonder if you can chime in about those um, exciting maps that are going to be produced later this week. Yes, you can find out. Um, you can, um, once you contact me after the webinar, I can walk you through it. Um, we worked with Frack Tracker Alliance um, to analyze the data in Frack Focus and uh, we have a spreadsheet showing where these wells are located. And then Frack Tracker um, later this week is going to be releasing some maps that will show you where the wells were located in Texas. Thank you. Uh, question from Harv Teitelbaum. Has the finished product of fracking, that is the methane or so-called natural gas that is sent out to consumers in homes been tested for trace PFAS? And have well workers been tested for PFAS body burdens? Not that I'm aware of. Me neither. I've had discussions with uh, individuals that work in the uh, fracking industry. And aside from the fact that hardly any of them have the proper PPE, um, they're very discouraged on reporting anything to anybody about anything. Um, so I, I doubt that the industry, and, and, and at the heart of this, I think the reason why a lot of these shell games and, and super secret uh, chemical stuff uh, is there and it, it's pr to, and to protect the industry against not only lawsuits from the public, but lawsuits from their own workers. Um, I would be curious to see what a, uh, a 20 year study is on uh, the longevity and, or cancer rates in uh, frac workers. 
um, or places where they've uh, fracked in the uh, you know Farmer Jim's uh, field, uh, what the cancer rates are downwind from that particular uh, particular well site. Uh, that's you know those are the things that we're going to address thirty years down the range when we start having these cancer clusters pop up. We are about running out of time. I was gonna see if we can squeeze in one more question. This is from Michael Martin. He says, we have seen the huge cost of dealing with the past use of lead in paint, gasoline and other products. Do you foresee that the use of these PFAS could have a similar cost to society in the years to come? So the answer is, I believe yes. In fact, there's been some limited economic analysis um, done on use of PFAS or even just use of cleaning PFAS. And you were talking about huge amounts um, of money that will be required. As I said, there's no easy way to clean it up once it's out there in the environment. Um, and there's no easy way to get rid of it from your body or either. The industry is gonna cause us um, large amounts of expenditure in the future. Uh, they're taking the drill cuttings that carry radium and they're dumping them into, um, if they had to abide by, uh, by Department of Energy standards, these cuttings would have to be sent to someplace that deals with uh, radioactive uh, waste. Uh, they're, they're putting these in dump sites. They're down blending them. Uh, they, you know, the state of Ohio just um, put two bills, one from the house and one from the state to allow uh, dumping of uh, radium contaminated water uh, 10,995 times the EPA limit from five pico curies to 20,000 pico curies on our roads. All of this is, you know, this is, all of this is going to eventually come and bite us in the backside. Just like Love Canal came back and bit people in the backside. We, you know, we thought we got rid of products. We're gonna have super fun sites popping up all over because of this industry. And the problem with it is by then, these companies will have folded, went out, went out of business, went bankrupt, changed hands, and it's going to be the taxpayer. It's going to get caught cleaning this bill, with the bill for cleaning this all up. And that's. I just, I just have to mention that I'm a co-author on a paper that was just published last Tuesday, which calls for the polluter to pay. That sounds right to me. Um, as PSR is fond of saying, there is no cure; there is only prevention. With that in mind, I'd encourage all of you to go to www.psr.org. Uh, on our homepage, you'll see a link to a page where you can access the report and also our letter to the EPA. Add your name to the letter to the EPA. I invite your friends to do the same. Thank you so much for joining today uh, on this important expose. And thank you so much to all of our wonderful guests. It's been a rich and wonderful uh, conversation. Sorry to those of you whose questions we didn't get to. Not enough time, but uh, stay tuned. I'm sure you'll be hearing more about this topic. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.